Morning all. All right, so uh, news of the day video mixed in with your preview video due to the fact there's only three games tonight in the National Hockey League. But I need to start off talking about the Connor McDavid goal from last night. Now, in real time and watching it, and thankfully it was the only game that was on at that point, so it had my undivided attention, I thought it was offside. Uh, as soon as they were reviewing it and they showed the replay, I said, I said to myself out loud, well, he doesn't have control of the puck there, so that's offside. Um, and then I see all the arguments about whether it is or it isn't. Oh, you got this wrong, and the NHL got it wrong. And, and there's, a, there's a nice thread from Dave Jackson uh, on this. So if you're still on the Twitter machine, there's a nice 10-post um, ten, ten thread from Dave Jackson on there uh, where he explains the, the situation room and, and how it's not just like a couple of guys sitting there and, and deciding what is or isn't. Uh, right, that there's there's a there's one person assigned to every single game. So on a 13 game night, you've got 13 people, one for each game, and they're loggers, and they 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 know the situation of the game, and he even said that they have made a decision usually before the referee actually gets onto the headset, uh, and as soon as there's a situation in any game, uh, that there's a bunch of supervisors, there's people there, and these are people who have thousands of games of experience. Uh, whether it's as a coach, whether it's as a player or as officials, uh, they have just so much experience. And these are people who, who do their best to know the game. They have the rule book right there at all times. And so, you know, he, he basically says to, you know, the, the whole discussion, and I, I, I've really never gotten into it because I, I think it's silly. The idea of having this entity that's situated as a situation room that is just there to screw over certain teams is... It's a Legion of Doom bridge a little too far for me. I, I I just can't get there. I did think it was an offside goal. And as soon as the announcers mentioned the Makar goal, I went, oh, not that again. No, don't do that. Come on. Because, again, I, I understand. I, I get it. I get it. I understand why Oiler fans are mad. Generally, it's Oiler fans that are mad right now. Um, but I, I did think that goal was offside. I did think they got the call right. I know that's not going to make people happy. I, I know... I know the comments that come out of that, but I'm not going to stand here and say, oh yeah, no, no, they got that wrong, when I, I don't think that they did. So um, my argument was that I, I felt he had lost control of it going over the blue line, and usually those are called as offside, and since no goal results from it, we, we don't have this discussion, it doesn't end up in a video, because it's just an offside play, right? And in this case, it was an offside play on you know, a huge goal that was, it was a nice goal by Dreisaitl, and it's a shame to take that off the board. Uh, if the NHL ever decides to change how they enforce or view the offside rule, uh, obviously we'll discuss that at the time. Uh, they, they have changed the offside rule in recent history, so there's a possibility they change it again, but they did feel they were, they were calling it the way that it's supposed to be called and said after they felt that he lost control as he crossed the blue line. So again, I understand there are people who say, no, he didn't. And there's nothing that can be said to convince those people otherwise. And and I get that. Um, it's, it's why there's no political discussions on the channel. There's none of that stuff either because you're not convincing anybody else that they're wrong. It's just not going to happen. So at any rate, uh, that's, that's my view on the subject. And again, I know that there's a lot of other people who are going to totally disagree. And, and of course, the argument is always, well, if it was the Canucks... Yeah, the Canucks have so many calls that go their way. That's really common for Canuck fans after a game to say, wow, I'm really glad the officials were really, really nice to Vancouver. I've never seen an argument about Vancouver and officiating. So, that being said, uh, the the preview now, we shall move into the preview part of this, the programming. Uh, 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Pacific start tonight. Yeah, it's a later start than normal by about an hour. Uh, Chicago 7, 17, and 4. Uh, we'll be in against the Minnesota Wild, who are 16, 11, and 2. Minnesota's got it rolling right now. I thought about wearing a Chicago jersey, and I thought, I, th there's just, I don't see a way this this works out for them. October 30th, it was a shootout win for Minnesota, 4-3. Uh, these teams will meet again March 25th and April 10th. Uh, for, the Mon for the Chicago Blackhawks, Domi, who played for Montreal, had his best season statistically in Montreal. I started to say Montreal. Uh, Domi, 10 goals, 10 assists, 20 points. I think he's having his best season since that big season in Montreal. And so it's nice to see him producing again. And whether or not that means that he gets them more back at the deadline, we'll see. Uh, and Taves has been playing well lately too. 9 goals, 7 assists, 16 points. And obviously he's great at face-offs, so... 
he will he will likely be moved at the deadline. Although I do wonder how teams are going to make the cap work. Uh, I'm I'm foreseeing a lot of three way deals where teams are are dumping cap in a couple of spots so that they can actually acquire the player. Meaning the original team retains, and then a third party retains money too at the expense of a draft pick. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Anyways, on the Minnesota side, Boldy, who's been having a very good season, 11 goals, 10 assists, 21 points for him. Eh, you might want a few more points from Boldy, but he's still playing pretty well. And Sam Steele's been good lately too, 6 goals, 3 assists, 9 points. Obviously the 9 points might be a little bit lower than, than one might hope, but yeah, the 6 goals, he's playing well. Uh, then at 9 Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific, the St. Louis Blues, who were involved in that game against Edmonton, uh, against the Calgary Flames. This is the first of three meetings. They'll meet again January 10th and 12th. So, uh, back-to-backs in January. For St. Louis, they're now 14-15-1. They're trying to get back to 500. Uh, Jordan Cairo's been very good lately. 11 goals, 15 assists, 26 points. Uh, he signed that big contract, had a rough start to the season, and immediately people were dunking on the contract. They've been quiet lately. So, Saad... Uh, his name's on the board because he's very prominent shorthanded. Six goals, two assists, eight points, and his shorthanded play is excellent. So we'll see how Calgary does with that. They're 13, 11, and 6. Nazem Kadri, 11 goals, 11 assists, 22 points. He definitely slowed down after a really good start to the season, but recently uh, the offense has started to show up again. Dylan Duve, not a lot of offense from him, comparatively speaking, with his work ethic. He has five goals, nine assists, 14 points. But I will say with Dubé, uh, he reminds me a lot of Majapani just in that work ethic department. And with players like that, they they do tend to have one season where they have a lot of goals. And I think with Dubé, he's going to be one of those guys who eventually has a 30-goal season kind of out of nowhere. Then at 9.30 Eastern, 6.30 Pacific, the Islanders in against Arizona. This might be a mistake because Arizona beat the New York Islanders in New York November 10th. So the Islanders likely will remember that and might lay a drubbing on the Arizona Coyotes. Uh, for the Islanders, they're 17, 12, and 1. Barzell is having a very good year. Three goals, 27 assists, 30 points for him. Parisi's been good lately, too. Nine goals, five assists, 14 points for Parisi. And he'd have more than nine goals. There have been a couple of opportunities he's had that just haven't quite gone in. Uh, and on the Arizona side, they're 9, 14, and 4. Michelli, two goals, 18 assists, 20 points for him. Uh, he is really pushing himself into the Calder discussion. The amount of goals will hold him back, but the fact that he's got 20 points on the Coyotes and he's playing quite well will get him attention. And McBain's been quite good too. Four goals, two assists, six points. So for the Coyotes, one thing they have going in their favor uh, is that they're starting to get some of these good young players into their lineup. And we're seeing that the, the plan for the future is unfolding. You know, we're starting to see these young players come in. The team's going to get better. Uh, now moving on to news of the day. Uh, Nate Schmidt has been placed on IR by the Winnipeg Jets after getting injured last night. Uh, so they've recalled Ville Hainola. I like Hainola a lot. I do wonder if he's ever going to get like a full-time job with the Jets or if he's going to have to go somewhere else. But uh, we'll see how he does in his call-up and whether or not uh, he fights his way into a regular job with the Jets. So... Uh, Schmidt being on IR is not great news, but Hainola is a good replacement. And it's one of those times where you can see the, the teams with depth, where they're calling up a player and you go, oh, I know who that is, I know what he does. Yeah, he's a good player. Uh, whereas there's times where a team will call a player up and we think, who? He does what? And sometimes they're good, but, you know, the, that's the difference between the teams that have that depth and the teams that don't. Speaking of depth, uh, the Detroit Red Wings have added a little bit today in Jacob Vrana. Uh, getting out of the NHL, NHLPA player assistance program, he has been reinstated to the National Hockey League. So whatever he was going through, I'm glad that that's finished. I'm glad we're going to see him back on the ice. No word as of yet that I've seen on when he's coming, by, coming back to play for Detroit, how quickly that's going to happen. I would think it probably won't take that long. Uh, he's probably stayed in shape throughout going through this program. And uh, I would think maybe a week to get ready. Maybe he'll spend some time in Grand Rapids just to make sure he's got all his timing down. And then, uh, yeah, you play him. So we'll see. But uh, good news having Verana back. Uh, interesting news this morning with the Bruins, too, in that they've revealed the the masks that are to be worn by Swayman and Olmark. Olmark has a really nice throwback to Andy Moog with his. I think it's great. Moog's mask was my favorite back in the day. Uh, part of it being because, you know, Andy Moog was one of my favorite goaltenders, but also I thought it looked pretty good. The funny thing is the, the bear on the shoulder, uh, that meth bear, it's uh, it's an odd logo, and yet somehow it worked as a goalie mask. 
It does with Olmark too. It absolutely works. So uh, looking forward to seeing that on the ice for that Winter Classic. And I mean, if if they win that Winter Classic game against Pittsburgh, maybe maybe use that. Maybe you can use that that mask regularly, right? Like. Maybe you can do that, as if Olmark's going to watch my videos. Anyways, uh, yeah, wearing that mask is nice. Swayman's is very nice as well, uh, but I, I had to mention the Moog throwback because Moog fan here. Uh, Pierre Lebrun reporting that the Edmonton Oilers are looking at acquiring depth on the blue line. They, of course, have cap problems to solve if they're going to make this work. Uh, Klingberg is on a $7 million contract. It's just the one year, though, so this is the difference. Klingberg is on a one-year deal. Klingberg is an offensive defenseman who has struggled in Anaheim this year. He's also had an injury in Anaheim. Um, and it's it's been a tough transition for him. He spent his entire career in Dallas, so it makes sense that he might have a little bit of a struggle with a new team. And also, that team, not a very offensively-minded team overall. And so, yeah, it makes sense that Klingberg's numbers would drop. The other player that they're looking at is Joel Edmondson out of Montreal. And with Montreal starting to really fall off now... Um, he may become available, but it's a three and a half million dollar cap hit for him into next season. So there's another year left. So if that cap hit isn't a problem for the Edmonton Oilers moving forward, maybe Edmondson's the better choice. Um, maybe you try to find a way to make room for both. Uh, in that Klingberg's a good offensive defenseman, Edmondson's more of a stay-at-home defenseman. Uh, and the Oilers, I I think, I mean, depending on on how you feel about uh, Barry. Nurse Bouchard is offensive defenseman. You might be more inclined to go after Edmondson. But if you have doubt about the offense coming from the blue line, you might be more likely to go for Klingberg. And maybe one of the other Oiler defensemen goes in, in exchange. So uh, maybe it could be a hockey trade where it's a one-for-one. One. Uh, they they change the look of the blue line uh, without necessarily acquiring that added depth. But they're going to need that added depth as well. But Klingberg and Edmondson aren't really depth guys. So we'll see what they do. Uh, but again, these are internal discussions, so there's no uh, nothing from LeBron to indicate that they've necessarily talked to the Ducks or talked to Montreal yet, and that's just that's what they're looking at is help on the blue line. Uh, I'm sure they would accept a little bit of help with depth on the wings as well, but it, it is the defense uh, that they'd be looking at uh, making a change with. Now, from last night's games too, uh, Pittsburgh, of course, Malkin got hurt and left the game. It's an off day today for Pittsburgh, so we likely will not hear uh, about any injury update on Malkin. Although, uh, Coach Sullivan seemed to be optimistic that it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, and and that's that'd be great news, right? So, uh, that goal was in the third period. There were 12 games going on at the same time. So, one thing that does does tend to happen when there's that many games on, as I said, it was tipped in. Um, and I saw the replay really quickly, and then I had to switch over to another game because it's third period. Uh, so it's the third period in eight games at the same time. It's the second period in two. Uh, I guess at that time, no, the, the, I don't think, it was second period in one. I don't think the Vegas-Chicago game had started at that point. It was 5.30 start for that one. Um, no, it would have started by that point. So yeah, there were 10 games on at that time. Could be 12. Could have been the first period between Buffalo, Colorado, and uh, St. Louis, Edmonton. I, I do my best to follow as well as I can. Uh, but yeah, so uh, when it tipped in, means went in off his knee and he's hurt. So uh, yeah, hopefully it's not too bad. But with Melkin, he does get his injuries. I'd feel kind of bad because I said in a video recently uh, that hoped his injuries were out of the way and now he gets hurt. So clearly there's a jinx from the videos, right? Because that's the thing. But anyways, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, as always. And I, I know there are people who are going to be trying to say, oh, here's why you're wrong about the McDavid goal, and here's why the NHL's wrong, and here's why the referees are wrong. And I, I get it, but again, to me, he lost control as he went into the zone, and that's usually called as offside. When I see that, I think the linesman blew that play. And I do wonder with linesman uh, what happens with that. I do think that it would be a good idea for the NHL to produce a 30 and 30 kind of thing on the, uh, the, the situation room and, and maybe about the officiating and you don't have to get into specifics. Like you don't have to show us a referee getting chewed out or a linesman getting chewed out, but you can get into, here's what our, our policies are and procedures are. And here's how it works in the war room. Here's how it looks. Here's how it is. And again, you can do that. Well, you blur whatever you need to blur, and bleep whatever you got to bleep. But, you know, giving us some sort of a look at it, I, I think would be interesting. I would find that very entertaining. But I'm a stats guy, so I might find things that you would find boring fun, and you might 
find things fun that I would find boring. So that's the thing. But anyways, let me know your thoughts. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.